Please turn your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Um, most of you are here this morning, but uh, I'll give you the very quick version of, of what Andy said. The announcement that Andy made this morning about giving money to Rick Shockey's granddaughter um, that has been undergoing chemotherapy and, and other things in Georgia. The fundraiser is this weekend that they're doing for her and the other young boy. Um, and he said to give the money to him or give that to me, uh, partly because he's not here tonight because he's over at Oakwood Road with the young people. And um, if you want to contribute to that, please make sure you see me tonight. If you forgot and can get it to me tomorrow, um, I'm going to be the one to mail that. So I will mail that to Rick on Tuesday. So if you want to call me, call my cell phone, call the office, whatever, and you want to run a check by, as, as Andy said this morning, make it out to Rick Shockey, and we'll mail all those to him, and then he can do with those things. So anyway, yes? Yeah, hey, Clinton. Um, Pam uh, today talked to Christy Shockey. Okay. Write it for caring for a cause instead of Rick. Yeah, yeah. And, and specify a strike against cancer on that. Pam will post it on the bulletin board. Yeah. Here. But she, if. Yeah, she preferred that we do it that way. If you like to write a check, you may prefer a check. Okay, you know? yeah. And so if you want to do that, please do that. But if you plan to do that, I will send the check out, the envelope to Rick, probably about 11 o'clock on Tuesday. So. You know. uh, yeah, I'm sure if you've already made it to Rick, that would be fine. And if you've already got that done, if you haven't done it yet, we'll do what, what, what Pam has got there. But anyway, if you can do that, get that to me uh, tonight, tomorrow. Just let me know before I drop it in the envelope. I usually go check the mail by 11 o'clock in the morning because that's usually about the time they have the mail up. So I'll, I'll put that in and check the mail at that time. So if you can get it to me by Tuesday at that point, I'll make sure and get it in the envelope. Okay. All right. As I said this morning, and we've been looking, um, I started a series a couple weeks ago, and we're going to be going through some different highlighted lessons from the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn with me to, Re to Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at the seven churches of Asia. We're going to look at them in order. Last time, two weeks ago, we looked at the letter to the church in Ephesus. And, and really, that's one of the most powerful ones. Um, there's certainly a lot in that one. Um, I, I, I really love, especially, you know, the book of Ephesians. We're going through the book of Ephesians in our Tuesday class. And when you think about the special relationship that Paul had the Apostle Paul, with the church at Ephesus. And you see their role in the book of Acts, and you read the book of Ephesians, and then you realize they're the ones that, that Paul met with their elders on his way to Jerusalem before he was arrested and sent to Rome. And then you realize, fast forward 30, 40 years later, and you come to the book of Revelation, and they're the church that has left their first love, and they've fallen from a great height. And it just breaks your heart to think about where they were back in the 40s and early 50s A.D., where they were at the time that the Apostle Paul you know, was with the congregation and spent his time with them and where he wrote the book of, of Ephesians to them. And you see where they are now. They've fallen from a great height and left their first love. There is a cautionary tale for any and every single congregation that we are always just one generation from leaving our first love and falling from a great height. And so it, is a, it should be a cautionary tale. The story of, of the church of Ephesus should be a cautionary story for every single congregation to say that could be us in one generation if we don't 
stay true to the things that Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesus, that we don't leave our first love, we don't fall from the great height. And so that was the lesson we looked at two weeks ago. If you remember, in just looking in, in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7, you see that's the section to the church at Ephesus. And I noticed, and I noticed a couple things that I brought out to you of things that are similar, and you're going to see those also in our lesson tonight in verses 8 and following to the church at Smyrna. You'll notice every single one of these letters to the seven churches is addressed to the angel of the church in. And of course, when we look at the book of Revelation in chapter 1, the angels are the stars, the, the seven stars, and the angel is the messenger or the, the one that brings the message to the church. And so to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. And then Jesus identifies himself in all seven of those individual letters. But what is remarkable is Jesus identifies himself differently in all seven letters. And so that's one thing to notice. Last time we looked in verse 1, he says to the church, the angel of the church in Ephesus, here's who it says. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now in chapter 1 we saw that the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches and the lampstands are the seven churches of Asia that are the recipients of this book. So who is it that's writing? The one that holds the stars and walks among the lampstands. We know who that is. In chapter 1, we see the, the, the picture of who that is, the vision that John sees, and we know that is Jesus Christ. Because in the very beginning of chapter 1, there, there in chapter 1, he tells that, that what he sees, and, and, um, and he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, and, and he is who is, and who was, and is to come. You know, he is the first and last, and of course, one of the names of Christ. And you'll notice that, you know, what he sees, he sees the vision of the, of the, of the man. The vision of the man we, we know is, is Jesus Christ. And when he speaks, he speaks to John, and he gives that revelation directly to John. So... What we can get, and we can make this a separate whole set of lessons by itself. We won't, but we could do this. And it is the seven different things that Jesus identifies himself as in each of these letters. So, he identifies himself as the one with the stars in his right hand walking among the lampstands. Now to verse 8 to our text tonight. He says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Here's what he calls himself. The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. And so Jesus identifies himself. Not only is he the one that holds the stars and walks among the lampstands, he is the first and the last. And he's also the one that died and the one that came to life. One of the most important things you'll recognize in the book of Revelation that helps make the book clear is all the different names and titles and descriptions given for the Lord. There's many of them throughout the book. And so here he is. He's the one that holds the first and last, the one that died and came to life. And so that is significant, obviously, because Jesus dying and coming to life is how we find our salvation. Because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection by God, then that completes the process that we go through when we die to sin, when we're buried in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life, we symbolize and connect with the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. And it was only the resurrection that completed that process. And so here it is. Who is the authority that's speaking to John? John didn't just write this down on his own. It is the one who died and rose, came to life, that writes this to him. The other thing, as I said, each one of these 
letters ends the same way. It begins with an address in a different way, a different way of speaking about Jesus from Jesus. And then the last verse, verse 7 of the first context is, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That statement is made in all seven of the letters. To the one who conquers, there's a promise given. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So that is the blessing that is attached to those that live the way that God has said. So, you know, if you're reading the letter to the church of Ephesus, and you read that, and you go through that, and you recognize the promise, okay, if you follow what he says, then the promise, the blessing you get at the end of it is that you'll get to eat of the tree of life. Well, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? The, the tree of eternal life that we get to partake in it is there. And where is that? It's in the paradise of God. In other words, it's in heaven. It's with God. So not only do we get to eat of that tree, you know who gets to eat of that tree? Only the people that are in the paradise with God that get to eat of that tree. And so a lot of things are promised there in that. And, you know, just simply because of one, yes, not only it's just getting to eat the, of that tree, it's because you're allowed into the location and allowed to be where the tree is, which is in heaven or paradise with God. So, now to the last verse of the text we're going to look at tonight, verse 11, he says the same thing. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I didn't really say much about that the last time, and, and I kind of skipped over it just a couple moments ago. But when you look at that, you know, the, you hear that phrase sometimes in Scripture, he who has an ear. Now, the question is, who has an ear? Well, we all have two of them, don't we? We all have an ear. We all have that. And so it's kind of like one of those statements where, like, everybody, listen, there's a little more to it than that. It's a standpoint of anybody that really cares, anybody that wants to hear, anybody that wants to know, if you've got the opportunity to hear, listen up. What the Spirit says to the churches. So not only... Are these words in red because it is Jesus Christ who is saying them? But who else is at work in all of this? Who is the one that's speaking to the churches? He says it's the Spirit. So the Spirit of God, i.e. the Holy Spirit, is also active as the inspirer of all Scripture. He's the inspirer of this Scripture, the, the revelation given by Christ to, uh, to John uh, the Apostle. And so, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And so, listening to them and paying attention to what is being said. Then, here it is, this, this other promise that's different than the first, but a promise uh, that is equally as good. He says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So, in, in, the, in the first one about we have access to eat of the tree of life. And now this one is not going to be hurt by the second death. What a great promise that is. Because what is the second death in scripture? Well the second death is the death eternal. You know and that's what a lot of what Revelation is about. Is about the death in this world by persecution that, that many of them were going to experience. But what was even worse was the eternal death that would come upon all those that were in opposition to God or unfaithful to Him or opposed Him. That all of the warnings and all of the, the, um, the things that we'll see later on in Revelation are all about those that are going to have those things come upon them. So if you are the one that conquers, then you're not going to be hurt by that second death. Now, diving into the letter, which begins, as we've already read, verse 8, verse 9. And this is into the letter of the church at Smyrna. I know your tribulation and your poverty. And then he has in a, in a parenthetical note, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Jesus, of course, is writing and in, in speaking. And he says, I know about your, your tribulation. I know all about what's going on with you. You know, sometimes, and you've heard me say this or things like this before, that sometimes life gets difficult and you feel like you, you're praying and you feel like your prayers don't get where you want them to go. And you feel like, you know, God is maybe, he's not paying attention. You're getting clobbered. You're getting surrounded. It's, it's difficult and things are, you're struggling, but yet, Nothing's changing. Nothing's helping. And maybe that's kind of the way that the, the people in Smyrna were feeling. But Jesus looked at them and said, I know your tribulation. I know what you're going through. I know about those difficulties. You see, the all-seeing and all-knowing God knows all those things. He understands those things. He, he, he gets it. And his people, at different times throughout human history, have had difficult times. You know, and, and we, we, we sometimes get, we get wrapped up in a two or three year stretch, or maybe even a few months stretch, and we think, wow, when's this going to end? Well, let's back up the train and think a minute. What if you were one of those Israelites in the land of Egypt for 400 years? You know? I've struggled with things sometimes, and I've had dark periods. I'd have dark seasons where, you know, I could maybe say I was, I was discouraged or depressed and, 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 and feeling pretty low, but it's never approached 400 years. Um, I've, I've had some time, but, but they were usually seasons, you know, months or a year or two or whatever, but nothing on the order of anything like you know, some of the times that, that they went through, some of the times that, that Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the prophets, the, the 80 years of captivity that they went through, there have been some dark periods in the history of God's people. Times that, you know, a lot of people lived and died and never knew a good time. And so, you know, was God away? Was God not paying attention? Well, of course not. God was right there listening, caring, Hearing the voices, hearing the prayers, hearing the cries of the saints or the, or the people of God at any and all times. But sometimes you just have to go through it. And it's difficult to go through it. And he said, I know your tribulation. And, you know... We, we pray to a God who has a son to, to intercede for us, our high priest, as we know in, in Romans 8. And then also in, in Hebrews chapter 4, that it says that he's a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because in all points he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. We... We have a Lord. We have a Savior. We have the one that's doing the speaking in this text who knows what it's like to struggle, to know what it's like to have tribulation, to have people hate you, to have people spit on you, to have people revile you like they did to him. And he knows what it's like to go through those things. And so he cares. And he takes note of those things. And even if it may not seem like it, he does. He knows what we're going through. He knows what they were going through. He says, and I know your poverty, even though you're rich. How could you be in poverty but yet be rich? It's because you've got to be rich in the right things. You know, sometimes those that have the least of this world's goods have the greatest of all things. And that is the, the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, the 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 ability and the opportunity to lay your head on the pillow at night knowing you're right with the Almighty God. That makes anybody a rich man or a woman. We have great wealth in realizing that our treasure is not in this earth, but in the world to come. And realizing that even if they didn't have great material possessions, what they had was greater than any other thing. You know, like what we're also looking on Sunday mornings, going through the, the, um, the Beatitudes. Remember, uh, a couple weeks ago we looked at, 
you know, the blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And even when Luke records the same thing, he even says poor. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it may be something that Jesus even said separately in other, in other places and times. But what you recognize is, is that God can give to us spiritual things. God can give to us blessings that far outweigh any material things that we might ever have. And so the kingdom of heaven is worth more worth vastly more than anything we might ever attain here on earth. And then after that, he says, and slander those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. This is clearly a reference to some Jews in the city of Smyrna. Apparently, there was a synagogue. Now, I'm sure the name of it was not synagogue of Satan, um, they would not have named it that. But who is, who is acting there? Who is the one causing the persecution upon the church? Who's the one behind it? And it's Satan. You know, so many times we, we blame the wrong things. Um, who, who is the enemy of, of all that is good and right in this world? It's not any political party. We may want to we may want to aim it at that, but it's not that. It's Satan. Satan's the run. It's the real evil, and Satan's hold on people's hearts. It's not a an activist group. It's not a lobbying group. It's Satan. Satan is responsible for evil, and he is the one. And so he is the one that has brought that about. And what happens is that sometimes people get led by that evil and do evil things. But ultimately, evil comes from Satan. And so here this synagogue, this would be Jewish leaders. He says they say they're Jews, but they're really of the synagogue of Satan. They were apparently persecuting. We don't really have much history on that. We don't really know anything outside of that. But what Jesus is saying here, that there is this synagogue, these, these people that call themselves Jews, but they're really being led by Satan, and all they're doing is slandering you, and they're trying to damage you. But realize, Jesus knows who they are. Jesus knows who they are, knows what they're about, and knows who's really behind what they're doing, and that's Satan. And so that synagogue of Satan, he knows all about that and what they're trying to do. He says, verse 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. When you look at that statement, you read that, and, and, and I almost want to take a deep breath when I read that. Because when you look at that, Jesus says, you're getting ready to suffer. And don't be afraid of what's coming. And Jesus could say that in a way that really only Jesus could. Because you recognize the suffering and the pain and the anguish that he went through for you and me. Could Jesus have kept them from suffering? Well, yeah. But that wasn't what was going to bring glory and honor to God. Could Jesus have kept the Apostle Paul from suffering at times? Well, yeah, of course. And others. You know, we sometimes act like if we get persecuted, we've done something wrong. Instead, maybe that we've done something right. You know, God's people have encountered suffering all the way through. And he says, I don't want you to fear about what you're ready to suffer. You see, Jesus, in a sense, is prophesying to them. He's telling them, it's going to get tough. Some of you are going to suffer. And it may well be what he would tell us today. I don't know. Certainly, there are many in our world today that are suffering because of the cause of Christ. People in unjustly imprisoned. There are nations in this world where they behead Christians. And they do all kinds of things against them. And so certainly that could be the case. He says, don't fear what you're going to suffer. He says, behold, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. 
Who's going to do this? The devil. And of course, who's running that synagogue down the road? Satan. So who's behind it? Who's behind the evil in the world? Who's behind the wickedness? Who's behind the persecution? Jesus is helping them identify correctly where the blame lies. It's the synagogue of Satan, and it's the devil is throwing them in. You know, we know and we point out that Jesus has had and does have and eternally will have power over Satan. But never misunderstand that Satan still has power. Satan still does have strength and has strength then. And so he is still able to do things. And he said, some of you are going to be thrown into prison because of the power of the devil. He said, so that you may be tested. And for 10 days you'll have tribulation. Now a lot of people, and the commentators are often divided on whether or not this is a literal 10 days or whether or not it is just simply a sign of, you know, being 10 days, it's a short period of time. Uh, 10 days is a week and a half. Um, it's tough if you're going through torture, but it's a short, finite amount of time. And so whether it was a literal 10 days of trial, or whether it was a symbol of being a short amount of time, is really immaterial. Because whether it's a literal amount of time or a short amount of time, it is just that, going to end. It isn't a forever. It isn't a forever. It isn't a something that's going to go on continuously. It is going to be a short time. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be, be rough beyond imagination. Don't fear it, but it's going to happen. And Jesus knows that it needs to happen so that they can be tested. And what happens when they get tested? Well, if they prove to be right, then what it does is it proves God to be even greater. And then he gives what is our memory verse for next Sunday. And that is this statement, to be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Now, we often use this phrase, this sentence there, sometimes a little bit out of context. But I don't think it's too far out of context. We will often include it in, like, say, our comments at the end of a sermon. Say, be faithful unto death and you'll get a crown of life. I think that's correct. But that's not really the specific context of this. He's talking about the persecution that they're going to receive. He's talking about those that are in prison, those Christians that are going to be uh, arrested by the members of the synagogue of Satan, put in prison by the devil, and, and quite possibly some of them are going to die. And so he's giving them the encouragement, you be faithful even up to the point of dying, even up to death, and you'll get a crown of life. Now, that's true if you're sitting in a jail cell and going to be beheaded the next day. But you know what? It's also true if you live to be 110 and die peacefully in your sleep. You got to be faithful to the end, okay? Although I think the original context is talking about the persecuted and those that may die due to stoning or beheading or whatever they were going to do in that immediate moment. And he says, I want you to know that if you're faithful all the way through, you're going to get a crown of life. And it's going to come to you. Also, if you look at what we looked at early on in our lesson, remember the promise at the end of this? The promise made to the church at Smyrna? He says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. I think that promise is a connection with, specifically, what's being said to the church in Smyrna. You be faithful up until death or up through death, and you're not going to be hurt by the second death. 
It's an indication to me, at least seems strong enough, that some of them are going to die or going to be despairing of life because of that persecution that's going to come. There were certainly many that died in the latter part of the first century and second and third century in the church. And so it's very possible that some of them in Smyrna were going to die as the result of this persecution that Jesus was talking about. And so he's warning them to be ready for it, but not to fear it. And the reason why not to fear it? Because if they're faithful, they're going to get a crown of life. A crown that is never going to perish, spoil, or fade, or end. And even more importantly, they're not going to be damaged or harmed by the second death that is ever going to come. So, you know, these letters to the churches aren't really that pleasant in some ways, are they? Now, on a positive note, nothing bad is said about the church in Smyrna which makes it one of the two churches that are that way. But, you know, here there's nothing negative said about them. You see, they haven't left their first love. They haven't fallen from a great height. All he talks about is are the things that are going to happen to them, the things from outside, the, the synagogue of Satan, the devil arresting them, and the persecution that's coming to them. You see, they've been strong, apparently. They've been faithful. And they're going to carry through with that. And so I want to ask you, whether you die tonight or whether you live to a ripe old age of 110 and die in your sleep, you know, are you going to finish strong? Are you going to be faithful unto death? Faithful to the end. And if you are, if we are, then a crown of life waits for us and will not be harmed by that second death. The saddest thing in the world to me is somebody that starts out, starts out well and goes through a lot of their life and then sits down and quits being a Christian. And I've known a few of those over the years, people that are much older than I and leave the church. And I just can't fathom doing that. You know, especially when they've been following God or, or faithful for a long time to sit down and quit closer to the end than the beginning. No one knows how long they have, but obviously some are closer to the end than the beginning. And, and, and to do that, and even though, like I said, that, that might not be in the exact context, but being faithful to the end matters. And, and certainly if you tonight think about your life and you think okay you know my faithfulness has been struggling and my commitment has been struggling and I want to change that and I want to seek prayers for that or that you're not a Christian then the promises of all this stuff the promise of eating of the tree of life the promise of the second death not hurting you that isn't true if you're not a child of God those aren't for you until you're a child of God and if you aren't we can change that tonight, and you can become one. You can be baptized into, the, into the, the Lord's death. You can be washed of your sins. You can be a child and become a part of his church. And those promises then apply to you. If we can help you in any way, please come while we stand and sing.